Hello everybody. So what we're going to start to discuss now is diffraction of light. Now when we looked at the double slit and the grating, I mentioned that when light goes through an aperture it spreads out. We call that diffraction. And that we would look at it in more detail. Well, now we're going to look at it in more detail. So once again I have a PowerPoint presentation uh, which, uh, with some slides that show you what the diffraction patterns look like for common apertures. I just refer you again to the near the uh, bottom of our course page. You can find these PowerPoint presentations. Here it is right here, this diffraction one. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start it up and um, we'll look at how light diffracts. Okay, now we're going to look at two particular types of apertures, uh, the slit and the circular aperture. And you are responsible for um, knowing some things about the patterns, the diffraction patterns for those two apertures. Okay, so let's look at the single slit first. So you can imagine we have a slit like that. The gray uh, area is opaque, so light can't get through there. And then there is this opening of slit width D, capital D, and light can pass through there. Now what I'm going to imagine is that my light is of one wavelength, so we can look at just the pattern of one wavelength, which will be very distinct and clear. If we set multiple wavelengths through here, uh, you really wouldn't be able to, to probably to discern distinct wavelength patterns because of the blending of the light. Okay, now I'm going to have my laser beam do something like this. So it's only clipping the vertical sides of the slit. We're really just looking at one dimensional uh, spreading of the light. Okay, we won't worry about what happens uh, if the light hits the horizontal edges. That's the so-called rectangular split. But what you see here downstream, this is a photo of a single slit diffraction pattern. This dashed axis, this is right from the center of the slit, which is the center of my beam. That's my reference axis. So you can see that the light does in fact spread out. Notice it spreads out, in this case, horizontally because it's hitting those vertical edges. And the way it spreads out though, the intensity, yes, the intensity peaks right at the center of the pattern, which is right along that central axis. But the intensity does decrease as you get away from that center. But it decreases, it forms a definite pattern though. And that's Another thing that we're interested in, not just the fact that the light spreads out and decreases in intensity as you get away from the center, but there, there's a definite pattern. That central uh, peak, uh, we call the central, okay, we call it the central diffraction peak. Makes sense, right? I'm going to refer to that as the CDP. And if you notice, there are these dark areas right in the center of one of these dark areas that would be a, an intensity of zero, what we'll call an intensity minimum. Okay, so uh, it's pretty cool how the light spreads out and forms this pattern. You can actually predict this pattern. Uh, we're not going to do it, but you can actually predict this pattern in intensity by looking at how the light is interacting with these edges. In fact, the construction that you do is pretty cool. What you assume, well, if you recall with Young's double slit, he was able to predict the interference maxima and minima by assuming that there was a point source in the center of each slit and the light spreads out uniformly from each point source. What you do here is you assume that the width of the slit is filled with an infinite number of point sources, a whole bunch of tiny little point sources lined up in a row. And you assume that each of those sends out a uniform wave. And then you add up or superpose all those waves at one particular point on your screen. So you actually end up doing an integration. It's a little bit more complicated, which is why we're not going to do it. It, it takes some time to develop and set up the integrals. But that uh, construction will actually give you this intensity profile. It's pretty cool. Okay, so let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to do sort of a top-down view now. Oh, I apologize for the phone ringing. So this is a top-down view. So this is my, the opening of my slit right here. 
my uh, and the distance to my viewing screen is L. Oh, and also just ignore these two dots. I didn't even realize these were there um, until I had finished my PowerPoint. And then by that time, I had a whole bunch of stuff on top, and I, I was didn't want to ungroup it all. So just ignore those ignore those two black points. Okay, so the laser beam is going to be coming like this. Here are just some rays showing the laser beam. All right, so again, it, the laser light is clipping these edges right here. So the light should spread out in this picture vertically. Okay, and so I just rotated the pattern so you would get something like this. Now, I'm only interested in this diffraction pattern for, for our class in where the minimum uh, or the minima are, where the intensities are zero. And you can derive using that integration method I discussed this condition. The minima, an intensity of zero, is given by d sine theta equals m lambda, where m is plus or minus one, plus or minus two, etc. Okay, now this again is the minima. In the double slit, we had a condition for the intensity maxima at d sine theta equals m lambda, where d was the separation of the slits. So that can be a little confusing, okay? So this is where the minima are. So for instance, I indicated the m equal one minimum, which would be right there at the center of that first dark area, and the m equal minus one would be here, okay? Um, you might ask, well, are the maxima in intensity given by d sine theta equals m plus one half, close parentheses, times wavelength? And the answer is no. <laughs> It, uh, it turns out that the maxima are not given by an integer times wavelength. The, the intensity peaks, the separation actually is not uniform. But again, I'm not interested for what we're going to do, um, what I'm holding you responsible for, in where the maxima are. Uh, they are close to m plus one half times wavelength, uh, but not exactly. Okay, so. The reason I want to focus on the m equal 1 and m equal minus 1 minima is if we just take the separation of those two, that physical distance, that's going to give us the width of that so-called central diffraction peak. And the way we can get that is we did this similarly for the double slit. If I assume that the distance between the aperture and the screen L is a lot, lot bigger than the opening of the slit, which is always going to be the case for us, these slit openings, again, are on the order of millimeters uh, or submillimeter. L is going to be several meters. Then you can do a small angle approximation, say the sine theta is approximately the tangent of theta, which is y over L, y being the position on the screen, y equals zero being right here at the center of the pattern. Then you replace sine theta with y over L, and you find out that the Positions on the screen of the minima, the y values are given by m lambda l over d. So if I just take the difference in y between m equal 1 and m equal minus 1 minima, I will get the width of this central diffraction peak, which is 2 lambda l over d, d being the width of the slit opening. So here's, you should remember this formula right here for the width of the central diffraction peak. You will notice that the central diffraction peak is twice as wide as the other uh, secondary peaks. So that's an interesting result too. Also notice that if we make D smaller, that the width of the central diffraction peak gets wider, the pattern spreads out. The light spreads out more, there's more diffraction. If we make D bigger, less spreading out. If the wavelength gets shorter, there's less spreading out. You can see that with the width of the central diffraction peak. If the wavelength gets bigger, the, you get more spreading, okay? So just keep that in mind. I'll talk more about that near the end of this, this video. Okay, so that's the uh, central, dif uh, uh, sorry, the diffraction pattern for a single slit. I do want to revisit the double slit, though. This is pretty cool. So what I have here, this is the single slit pattern you see up top. And here's the double slit pattern that we talked about in the last video. And at that time, I mentioned that Young's analysis can't address why the intensity is falling off. It only addresses where are the intensity maxima and where are the intensity minima. The intensity maxima are relative maxima because again the intensity peaks are falling off as you go away from the center. Well, the actual pattern that you see right here, this double slit pattern, it is a combination 
of that interference that Young analyzed in the single slit diffraction pattern. So what this picture right here shows you, in fact, is if you only do Young's analysis, which is labeled interference here, this is intensity on the vertical versus angle from the central axis on the horizontal. So if you only do the interference analysis, you will get these uh, equal intensity maxima peaks and then intensities of zero, okay? Which again is what we discussed when we did Young's analysis. If you only look at the single slit diffraction, which is up here above, you will get this blue curve. Here you can see the central diffraction peak, this big blue curve. Here's the first minimum right here at about 30 degrees. Then this peak, another relative minimum. I'm sorry, another relative maximum coming up. And then it would go down to another minimum. Then it would come up to a smaller intensity peak, then down to a minimum. And it would just keep going up, down, up, down until the light reached zero uh, intensity farther out. Well, the actual pattern that you see is the combination of the single slit diffraction pattern and the Young's interference diffraction pattern. So in this picture down here, this plot, the physical thing that you see is that red plot, okay, which is pretty cool. And you can see that in the actual photograph, right? You can see the presence of the single slit diffraction pattern in that double slit pattern. These fringes, the so-called interference fringes, again, are predicted by Young's analysis. Now, you can, in fact, have, depending on the separation of the slits and the width of a single slit, you can have what are called missing interference orders, which this picture is tr trying to show you. So in this particular combination of slit width and slit separation distance, there should be an interference maximum at m equal 3, but if that corresponds to a predicted minimum in the diffraction profile, you won't see that at all. That's a so-called missing interference order, which is what that plot's trying to show you. I'm looking in this pattern, and I don't see any missing orders. It looks like, yeah, I don't think I see, well, there, no, it doesn't, I don't think I see any missing orders. Uh, so again, that has to do with the combination, the ratio of the slit width opening to the slit separation distance. But I just wanted to come back and, and talk more about the double slit and say that the actual intensity pattern that we see with our eyes is a combination of the uh, double slit pattern analyzed by Young and the diffraction pattern of a single slit. I think it's so cool. Um, it, that, that the way the light behaves with these, and it's really the light be interacting with these vertical edges, if we have vertical slits, it's the light interacting with the edges that does this. Um, that the pattern of the double slit is centered right, right, right between the slits, the, the diffraction pattern. So it's not like you're getting two separate diffraction patterns from each slit centered on each respective slit. The whole diffraction pattern, one diffraction pattern, is centered on that y equals zero point. Okay, so that's that. Now, let's go and look at the circular aperture in this video. Um, yeah, um, we'll just do one video for both of these. So here's what I mean by a circular aperture. It's just a circular hole of diameter big D. So I'm going to call the opening again big D, and this is the diameter of the hole. The idea is that we're going to hit this with a laser beam that overfills that hole so that the laser light's interacting with the entire circular edge. And this is the pattern that you're going to see. The light again spreads out. Now, because it's a circular hole, it's spreading out in all directions. The intensity does drop off from the center. So again, this green, oops, sorry. This green axis is our central axis from the center of the aperture to the center of the pattern. So the intensity is uh, dropping off as you get away from that. It's, it's dropping off radially, but there's a definite pattern to the intensity drop off. Again, there are um, radii where there is no light at all, an intensity minimum of zero. Now, this pattern is sometimes called the Airy pattern um, after, I forget the guy's full name, but Airy, who produced, produced it and, and discussed it. 
the central bright disk is sometimes called the airy disk. Okay? And then the airy rings surround the airy disk. The airy disk I'm referring to as the central diffraction peak. Okay, uh, analogous to the central diffraction peak or CDP from the single slit. Okay, now you can analyze this again. Um, this is a fun integral to do. You have to end up doing a two-dimensional integral, it turns out. Uh, so you, you imagine that there are an infinite number of point sources inside the circular aperture, and you sum up all these waves, these spherical waves coming from these point sources, and you can actually predict this pattern. Again, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, in fact, the integrals that you get are, um, are a, a, a type of Bessel function. I don't know if any of your math classes, you may have uh, looked at some integrals that are the so-called Bessel functions. I think there are a couple different kinds of Bessel. I mean, I know there are a couple different kinds of Bessel functions that you can write as a series. It turns out that this diffraction pattern can be written as a, a Bessel function series if you look at the intensity. Okay, um, now, uh, again, just so we uh, can talk about the width of that central diffraction peak, what I did is I'm doing a top-down view similar to what we did with the single slit. So the opening of my circular aperture is over here is big D. The light spreading out uniformly in all directions. The minima are not equally spaced, it turns out. Not, and that's unlike the single slit. Uh, because of the two-dimensional spreading out of the light, uh, it turns out that mathematically the minima are not equally spaced. I'm only going to look at the first minimum. And the angle from the central axis that gives you the first intensity minimum of zero satisfies d sine theta equals 1.22 lambda. Okay? Um, and again, what you can do is you can find the radius of that airy disk or central diffraction pattern. Because that would, again, just be the distance from y equals 0 to this y of the first minimum. So again, you uh, make the small angle approximation. You assume that L, separation between aperture and screen, is a lot bigger than D. And you can replace sine theta with y over L. And you find out that if I, again, put a y-axis on my viewing screen, call y equals 0 the center, the first minimum should be at y equals 1.22 lambda L over D. Now, I can go down and say there's, there's also a y equal minus 1.22 lambda L over D position. Okay? But that enables us to get a formula for the width of the central diffraction peak, which would be the diameter of the so-called airy disk. So I just double this expression here. I get 2.44 lambda L over D. Uh, again, notice that if the aperture opening gets smaller, the width gets bigger, the light spreads out more. If the wavelength gets shorter, the light spreads out less. If the wavelength gets bigger, longer, the, way the light spreads out more. The width is getting bigger. Okay. Um, and, oh, one thing I, I wanted to show you well, maybe, maybe this is a, 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 a time to talk about it since we're talking about circular apertures. Um, if you look at the diffraction of light, as I said, as D gets smaller, you see that the width is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So there's less, uh, there's more light diffracting, 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 okay? But the amount of light that actually is spreading out is reducing. And if D gets small enough, now you have to look at D in relation to the wavelength. So if you look at D in relation to the wavelength, if D gets significantly smaller than the wavelength of the light, there is so much little light actually getting through to spread out that all of that light you could approximate as being reflected. So if the aperture opening gets small, is small compared to the wavelength of light, and again, it's, it's a gradual thing, but if D is less than the wavelength of the light by enough, any light that hits that opening will actually reflect. It, it's, it's a cool phenomenon, okay? Um, an application of this is, if you 
if you guys are cooking with your microwave, right, and, and your the light is on in your microwave and you peek in, you're peeking in, I don't know if you've noticed, but there are these holes that you're peeking in through, right, through the glass. The holes are large enough that the visible light can get through, but the opening of the holes is small enough compared to the microwave wavelengths that the microwave radiation is reflected back into the into the oven. So it's a neat application of if the aperture gets too small compared to the wavelength of the light, then any radiation that hits that opening is actually going to reflect. Okay. And as D, if D is significantly greater than the wavelength of the light, then the light's not going to spread out at all. Uh, well, it, it, it's not going to diffract at all. So that's where you're going to get sort of just what, like a, a nice sharp edge shadow, although it's not perfectly sharp edged. Okay. So if I have my laser beam, for instance, you know, if I'm sending it through a millimeter size opening and clipping the edges, then I'm going to get appreciable diffraction in this pattern. If I expand my beam so that it's, you know, a meter wide, uh, that, that's a big laser beam, but imagine I could do that. And now I have um, my uh, opening, right, that's on the order of a meter, like a doorway. And I shine that beam and it clips those edges. I'm not going to get significant diffraction. Okay, so the opening aperture is just too big compared to the wavelength of the light. So if, if I look downstream on a wall, you're basically going to see red light filling the doorway and then these edges of the doorway appear as a shadow. Okay, um, so not significant diffraction. So there are these regimes where you look at the opening compared to the wavelength of the light. Okay. Um, Oh, another thing I wanted to mention, I know, I, I know I'll shut up, I promise, in just a bit, is if you notice, as the wavelength goes down, the spreading out goes down. The width of the central diffraction peak goes down. Now, laser light going through circular apertures happens all the time. In fact, if you try to focus your laser beam down to a spot, you're not going to get a true tiny spot. You're going to get this diffraction pattern, an airy pattern because somewhere the light's going to be going through a circular aperture or encountering a circular edge. So if you think of like DVDs, uh, when they write a DVD, what they're doing is they're focusing light down, excuse me, focusing light down to a spot. And that spot is encoding a, a bit, a one or a zero. Think of it that way. So, but when they focus the light down to encode a bit, they're, they're getting an airy pattern. Now, if they decrease the wavelength of the light, they'll get a smaller spot size. So if we use, for instance, violet light, uh, like in a Blu-ray DVD, the spots are smaller. They don't spread, they don't diffract as much. So we can get more information on that DVD. So that's why the Blu-rays can hold more information and have, you know, super high def movies and everything else. So uh, again, that's due to the diffraction of the light. All right, one last thing I wanted, I wanted to mention, the so-called Poisson spot, although sometimes it's called the, and I don't, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mispronounce this, the Arago spot. Um, and what, what this refers to is, suppose instead of having a circular hole, you have an opaque disc. So here's just a, a disc, right? No light can get through that disc, but the light can get through, right, outside of the disc. So what happens if I take my spot on uh, my blazer beam and overfill that so it's clipping the circular edges? Well, it turns out, this is a pretty cool result, you actually get a bright point right here, right on this central axis. And this is known as the Poisson spot or the Arago spot. And there's a little historical story here. Uh, right around, this is uh, um, a couple hundred years ago, uh, Newton's theory of light was the prevailing theory at that time, and his theory of light was a so-called corpuscle theory, a particle theory. He thought light, light comprised, was comprised of a stream of these particles. And he said that, you know, because you think about it, if I throw a tennis ball at an angle and it bounces off a table, right, the 
the angle of incidence will equal the angle of reflection, provided I don't do any funky spin or anything like that. So he, he explained diffraction with this particle theory. He explained dispersion by saying that different colors, the, the particles were different sizes. He even had a polarization explanation saying that the particles were not spheres, they were ellipsoids. Okay, so that was the prevailing theory. But there was more and more evidence a couple hundred years ago, um, in the early 1800s, that maybe there was some wave-like nature to, to, to light, and maybe Newton wasn't right. So Young was one of the wave proponents, and a guy named Fresnel was one of the wave proponents. And they're producing, you know, publishing their ideas that light is a wave. Well, Poisson, it turns out, um, he was a member of some scientific academy, and he didn't believe the wave theory of light. So what he did, in fact, was he took some of the work, I think it was by Fresnel, or it may have been Young, and he studied it, and he said, well, look, this, this silly idea suggests that if light overfills a disk like this, an opaque disk, there should be a spot at the center on the central axis. And, you know, that's, that's just silly. Now, it turns out that people had seen this spot. He, I, he, he wasn't aware of anybody seeing this spot. But people elsewhere throughout history ha had observed this. But um, the guy, Arago, again, and I might be mispronouncing that, he's the one that did the actual experiment and produced the spot. And... Uh, so in honor of Poisson, who was trying to say this is a silly idea, he worked out the theory They this spot is now known as Poisson's spot. So it was a pr pretty good piece of evidence that light should be treated as a wave and that Newton's corpuscle theory maybe should be shelved. Okay. All right. That's it. I've talked too long in this video. All right. We'll, uh, we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. Oh. Before I, before I, this, don't, don't forget, go to the summary notes. Um, don't forget the summary notes. And what I want you to remember is summarized right here. And again, it's not a lot. It's just some things about the, the patterns for the single slit and the circular aperture. Okay, that's it right there. All right, bye-bye.